Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.22, Biography Edition, John Winthrop. Before we jump into our subject matter for today, I want to take just a moment to introduce a different kind of episode that I'm going to be doing periodically. Seeing that this is the first episode that I've done as a biography edition, I want to go ahead and explain what I plan to do with these reoccurring episodes. These episodes are going to be a bit different from what we've done so far and will exist largely as a supplement to the ongoing narrative. What I really want to accomplish with these biographies is to identify people who are going to be really important to our story moving forward. When I say really important, I mean the people who are going to fundamentally shape the United States. These are the people whose actions are largely going to come to define the American experience. This is not going to be a comprehensive list of people who do important things either, but rather people who I chose to go more in depth on personally. Otherwise, when we get to the American Revolution, this podcast would be nothing but biography after biography. I'll tell you right now that I'm going to do my best to focus on those figures that might not get as much attention as they should. I would anticipate that there's going to be just a couple of these every season, there may be some season with more, and there may be some seasons without any at all. As far as what we are going to be discussing, these biography episodes will also feature a little bit of a different structure. Instead of going into huge amounts of detail about their lives and everything they did, I'm looking more to give a broad overview of their life and their accomplishments. As for specific events that are critical to our story, those are going to be taken care of largely through the narrative itself. My hope is that when these people enter into the narrative, you've already got the background on the person to know that they're going to be super important. These episodes, therefore, are going to be structured in such a way that we are going to basically have two parts. The first part is going to be moving through a general history of that person's life, their accomplishments, failures, philosophies, and beliefs. The second part of the episode is going to be spent discussing their legacy and why they're important. I always hate when you're told that somebody is really important in history and it is just left at that. If somebody gets a biography on this podcast, rest assured that at the end, I'm going to make sure you know what their legacy is and why they're worth remembering. Okay, that should be enough talking about the show, so let's go ahead and move on into today's topic. Almost from the moment that he arrived in New England in 1630, John Winthrop would become amongst the most influential colonists. Winthrop, a highly religious lawyer from England, viewed the world through a highly religious lens. A Puritan who had become disturbed with the state of affairs in England under King Charles I, Winthrop would view his immigration to New England as nothing short of a biblical journey right out of Exodus. It is out of this that Winthrop would write a sermon entitled A Model of Christian Charity. In this, he referred to New England as being the city upon the hill. This ideal, the thought of, at the time just New England but later the country itself, as being a city on the hill, is something that has become deeply ingrained in the American ethos. As recently as Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, the city on the hill has continued to play an important role in American politics. In so many ways, the idea of a city on a hill encapsulates what the United States itself aspires to be. John Winthrop was born on January 20th, 1587, in the village of Groton, located in Suffolk. Groton is located to the northeast of London and around 50 miles east of Cambridge. Winthrop was born into a family of some means. His father was a local lawyer, and this means that it afforded him a degree of privilege as a child. When he was 14 years old, young John Winthrop was ready to enter into the university, and he would soon enroll at Cambridge. While at Cambridge, Winthrop would find himself in an environment that was decidedly pro-Puritan, a position that Winthrop himself would have already been familiar with through his father. Winthrop spent his youth in that hotbed of Puritan activity that was southeastern England. Recall from last time that this is the area that the Puritan movement truly flourished and expanded in. Following Cambridge, Winthrop became a Justice of the Peace in Suffolk. This was a position of relatively high stature and moved Winthrop into a more influential role. This position made Winthrop a local leader and put him in a position in Suffolk where he had the power to help influence local policy. It also gave Winthrop at least a peek at the practical functioning of a government, something that is going to be very important years in the future in his role as the governor of Massachusetts. In 
by all accounts, Winthrop remained consistently concerned that his actions were not sufficiently serving God. Winthrop would write that he was often concerned that he was not doing enough in his position to promote godliness. This is something that seems to have genuinely concerned him and later would be an important consideration when he goes to New England. Winthrop was a subscriber to the idea that the best method to help keep Satan at bay was with a schedule so busy that his soul would be kept pure. This means that his days were always highly structured events, mornings of prayers, work and business later in the day, and capping the night off engaged in study was the name of the game for Winthrop. In his personal life, Winthrop was no stranger to grief either. Winthrop's first wife, Mary Forth, died in 1615. Shortly after her death, Winthrop would marry again. However, within a year, his new wife would also be dead. In 1618, Winthrop married Margaret Tyndall. Tyndall would survive longer than Winthrop's first two wives, surviving until 1647. By the time that 1628 rolled around, Winthrop's career was flourishing. Winthrop was considering a move to London and by that time had become an attorney of the Court of Wards and Liveries. This was the position that for most people would have been the highlight of their career. At the same time, however, not all was right in Winthrop's world. As we discussed last week, throughout the 1620s, the Puritans in England were getting increasingly nervous about the way things were headed. The current movement of the Church of England in a decidedly non-Calvinist direction had Winthrop concerned that such a move had England on the road to damnation. In simple terms, Winthrop saw reform in the Church as the path to salvation. If England continued down the path it was on, that was going to result in the wrath of God being brought down upon England and her subjects. Winthrop had considered immigration before. At one point, he was considering going to Ireland. Winthrop saw Ireland as a place where the enlightened Englishmen could go and worship freely. Difficulties in selling his matter in Groton would ultimately kill Winthrop's plans to move to Ireland. What we get from this episode, however, is the idea of leaving England was something that was always on the mind of Winthrop. The entire experience of considering a move to Ireland took place sometime around 1623. By the time that 1628 rolls around, England is in a much more precarious place for the Puritans. Charles, by this point, was looking more and more like an undercover Catholic, and at the very least seemed interested in stamping out Calvinism throughout England. Ireland may have fizzled out, but for John Winthrop, he was clearly worried about the direction of England and was open to the idea of leaving. As for how Winthrop learned about the Massachusetts Bay Company, that is something that has been largely lost to history. Winthrop was hanging out in London during the late 1620s and was likely in contact with several people who were at least sympathetic to the cause of those looking to head to New England, if not personally involved. Winthrop was aware of the preaching of John White, who, if you recall from last time, was one of the main driving forces behind reorganizing the Dorchester Company into the Massachusetts Bay Company. Winthrop soon found himself at the forefront of a group that was looking at New England as a place to escape the growing hostility in the religious situation that was developing throughout England. In some ways, it is surprising that Winthrop would decide to immigrate to New England. This is 1628 and 1629 now. There is no doubt about the condition of life in North America. Winthrop, an educated man, would have known about the disasters at Roanoke. He knew about the starving time in Jamestown, the struggles and the high death rate in early Plymouth. Plus, let's not forget the 1622 massacre in Jamestown that had become sensational news back in England. Winthrop's friends were quick to remind him as well that this was a really bad idea. At this point, they're all basically saying to him, John, what are you doing? You're not a young guy anymore, and basically everybody who goes to North America dies. This isn't going to end well, don't go. John Winthrop, however, had a few things going for him. First, he was increasingly prominent in England and may have seen going to New England as a chance to increase his personal influence. If Winthrop wanted to remake the world around him, the chances of accomplishing that in England during this period are extraordinarily slim. Yes, he was influential, but that influence only went so far. In New England, however, Winthrop could position himself in a central place where he would actually have the ability to create the new society that he so desired. Secondly, the Massachusetts Bay Colony was going to prove to have a big difference. It certainly didn't hurt his interest that the leadership of the colony was not going to be based in London like previous companies, but in Massachusetts itself. This means that the ultimate decision and orders weren't going to be coming from the investors in London who had never seen the land or the conditions on the ground. Rather, the colony was going to be run directly from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. 
the decisions being made were going to flow out of actual real-world conditions at that moment and not greedy investors. It also meant that the colony was going to have a degree of autonomy that neither Jamestown nor Plymouth ever knew. The autonomy meant that Massachusetts was going to have a much greater say in their own dealings and in the direction that their new society was going to move. For a man like John Winthrop, who seems genuinely concerned with building a better society, this must have seemed like a dream come true. In fact, all accounts show that it was right around this same time, late July of 1628, that the colony was seeking to move its corporate headquarters to Massachusetts, and that's right about the time that Winthrop really becomes involved in the project personally. The decision to move the headquarters from England to New England was not without political difficulty, and in fact looks to be something of a minor coup. The Puritans were not only interested in moving the headquarters, but then purging out those who disagreed with the general plan. Winthrop, unsurprisingly, was all for this, and throughout the planning for the transfer of the company to the new colony, Winthrop emerged as a leader, a position that he is going to hold for much of the remainder of his life. Once Winthrop personally made the decision to immigrate, probably during the summer of 1628, he quickly found himself not only a leader, but one of the primary promoters of the company. Winthrop wrote a document called the General Observations, which was meant to be a laundry list of the reasons for going to New England. This document became widely circulated amongst the relevant groups and was one of the primary pieces of propaganda to get people on board with the idea of immigrating. Among the ideas espoused in the general observations were 1. Bring the gospel into America and raise a bulwark against the kingdom of the Antichrist. 2. Go to a place of refuge from judgment of God that was about to descend on Europe in light of the Thirty Years' War. 3. Escape the overpopulation of England. 4. Escape the growing inflation problem in England. Now, just to interject briefly here, this may well be referring to the growing economic issues throughout the region. Recall back from two episodes ago, we had actually discussed the textile collapse that was devastating the economy of southeastern England. 5. Get away from Oxford and Cambridge and their increasingly corrupt practices and teaching. 6. God has given them the entire new world to go and improve. And to once again interject here, all that uninhabited land just sitting there was wasting away against God's will. It was, in Winthrop's mind, their job to improve the land. Now, of course, you may be saying that the land wasn't uninhabited, that the Indians were there. However, for Winthrop, that doesn't really seem to count. As of this moment, nobody really recognized that the Indians had much right over the land. Don't worry, though. This belief will soon be challenged, and that's something that we're going to have to wait until next time to address. 7. Those going to New England would have the chance to lay the foundations of a new church. 8. This entire observation ended with a plea from Winthrop that basically positions the trip to New England as some kind of a mission. It was something that they just had to do. The takeaway from this seems pretty straightforward. England was an overcrowded pit of despair filled with heathens and a faltering economy. New England offered a decent chance to escape this and start over again at the foundations of a new and better society. By August of 1629, Winthrop was one of a handful of men who had signed an agreement to wrap up their business in England and agreed to make the voyage to settle New England. Throughout the summer of 1629, meetings and negotiations continued towards the ultimate goal of moving the headquarters of the corporation to Massachusetts. For all of his work over the past year, Winthrop found himself elected governor of the colony on October 20th, 1629. It is a position that he would hold off and on for the rest of his life. It was decided that Winthrop would initially travel alone. His wife would be following in the future, as she was pregnant at the time. During his time as governor, while still in England, Winthrop was involved in the actions of negotiating with those investors in England that didn't plan on going along to New England. In flowery language, Winthrop told the investors that, look, the company is moving to New England. You guys aren't going to have a say in matters. Do the right thing, take the settlement, and drop your interests. Oh, and by the way, God is watching you. Well, he was not entirely successful of purging all of the London investors, who would continue to cause problems for him in the coming years. He did manage to eliminate the majority of them, thus ensuring more power would find itself centered in Massachusetts and not back in London. Finally, on April 8, 1630, Winthrop, along with 700 other colonists, would leave England and embark on a journey to the New World. <laughs>
It is at roughly the same time that he left England that Winthrop would deliver the sermon that would cement his legacy. Though unclear if the sermon was given in England shortly before the departure, on the trip over or even possibly in New England itself, Winthrop delivered a sermon known as the Model of Christian Charity. The sermon offered nothing in the way of plans for the colony, a declaration of what the government structure should be, or really anything that would be of any practical use in the colony. What it did deliver, however, was a vision for what New England should be. The model of Christian charity was one of three works which was primarily aimed at stating the goals of the new immigrants to Massachusetts. Their goals were twofold. They wanted to lay out what their mission was. The mission was to go over and work actively towards reforming the church. These works, the other being God's Promise to His Plantation by John Cotton and The Humble Request, which was also by Winthrop, sought to establish that while reforming the church was the main priority, they were not separatists. Winthrop and company had no plans to separate from the Church of England. They wanted to make that clear to everybody involved. Winthrop and those involved wanted to make sure that everybody back in London understood that they were all working for the same team. In the model of Christian charity, Winthrop would conclude by saying, We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, when ten of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies, when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations. The Lord make it likely that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all the people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and be word through the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the way of God, and all the professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants, and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us, till we become consumed out of the good land, whether we are going." the line from that speech. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all the people are upon us. Has a place as one of the most famous lines in American history. It serves almost as a mission statement for what the United States itself wants to stand for. Today, the legacy of the line is so often portrayed in terms of democracy or the moral attitudes of the United States, which genuinely really is not what Winthrop had intended. However, the fact remains that the simple line by Winthrop has withstood the test of time and remains one of the building blocks that the United States rests upon. Poetic sermons aside, Winthrop still is a colonist traveling to a harsh and unforgiving land. After an initial dispute over the location of the colony in Salem, Winthrop personally relocated to a new settlement off the Charles River near Massachusetts Bay in what would become Boston. Winthrop's next task was going to be the establishment of a government. We had talked last time about the government that was established in New England. The freemen, who were members of the church, had a vote for the assistant magistrates. Those magistrates would then vote for the office of governor. It is important to not get carried away here and begin thinking that John Winthrop was in any fashion an early Republican. And just a quick note here on terminology, because I want to be clear about this. Until we basically reach the Civil War, if you hear me mention Republicans, please know I'm referring to small r Republicans. In other words, these are not members of the modern Republican Party, but rather, these are those who advocate the creation of a republic. Got it? Good. Terminology aside, John Winthrop was no Republican. Winthrop's government was essentially a limited democratic dictatorship. Sure, members of the church did get a vote for their leaders, but that's where democracy ended. This was not a complex form of government. In fact, it was unbelievably simple. Vote for the guy you want. And then, up until the next election, they are going to have near-absolute power. Additionally, Winthrop was not a supporter of universal suffrage. He, in fact, did all he could to limit the electorate. Winthrop insisted that only those freemen who were members of the church could vote. This, of course, is going to have a widespread chilling effect. Members outside of the church would have no voice in government. Likewise, by limiting who could vote, it ensured that the church would remain powerful. This isn't to say that Winthrop wanted to establish anything looking like a theocracy. Instead, he wanted to limit suffrage to men whom he knew would support the Puritan way of life. In this way, Winthrop had not established democracy where the people act as the source of power. 
Rather, Winthrop had designed a system where a small group of loyal men tied more centrally to the church would become the source from which power could be obtained. So sure, John Winthrop was willing to let church members be part of the electorate. But at the same time, it is going to be a vast overstatement to refer to Winthrop as being a proto-Republican or even particularly Democratic. The power of the governor, which more often than not met Winthrop, had full rights over both the practical function of the colony and the legislative function. In terms of legislative action, there was relatively little early in the colony. Law and order was important, but they already had a law code, the Bible. Winthrop turned to the Bible as his legal code and was sufficiently satisfied to simply follow out the punishments prescribed within. Initially during those early years, Winthrop would develop a rivalry with Thomas Dudley. Dudley would often find himself at odds with Winthrop. Dudley repeatedly called out Winthrop's policies and would become a general pain in the side of John Winthrop. The biggest conflict between the men came over the laws. While both men supported the Bible as their legal basis, Winthrop took a more lenient view. Understanding that colonial life was harsh, Winthrop supported acting in a manner that gave more lenient punishments. Dudley, looking at this, said, Hey, we have a covenant with God. Who are you to disobey him when he came up with these punishments? Do you see a list of exceptions in leniency? Yeah, me neither. Eventually, Winthrop would lose out and would lose the governorship over these debates. But don't feel too bad for Winthrop. He is going to be back as the governor soon enough. What this really goes to show, however, is that it's not like Winthrop exists on an island in the colony. He does have to deal with political pressures of the day and navigate the seas like anybody else. Ultimately, Winthrop would become something of a moderate politically, wedged in between the more conservative Thomas Dudley, who we've been talking about, and eventually the more liberal-minded Roger Williams, who we are going to talk about in depth next time. This isn't to say that Winthrop would be a moderate by contemporary standards, because no, he really isn't, but at this moment, he found himself occupying that position. This also moves us to a more central point about the politics and the beliefs of John Winthrop. Winthrop often talks about covenants between the settlers and God. This dominated the worldview of Winthrop and was something that seemed always to be at the forefront of his policies. In Winthrop's mind, the people had an agreement with God. In some ways, this is not terribly dissimilar from the political thought a century later during the American Revolution. John Locke, one of the biggest influences in the Revolution, believed that a social contract existed between the individual and their government. This is a very popular line of thought throughout the Age of Enlightenment and would be a central theme of the entire era. Winthrop's beliefs are not that out of line with this. However, he views the contract not as one between a body politic and the government, but rather with God as the sovereign. In other words, there was a social contract between everybody and God. And again, this is not to say that Winthrop is some enlightened thinker. The guy really isn't. Winthrop was, as previously discussed, anti-democratic at his very core. In fact, Winthrop would write at one point that, a Democrat is amongst the most vile nations, accounted the meanest and worst of all forms of government. And because I already said it once, I want to be clear that Democrat in this instance is a small d Democrat. In this fashion, Winthrop viewed politics with a top-down approach. There is a compact between God and the people. As part of that, government arises, and liberty is something that comes from the government itself. The takeaway from all of this is that while it is tempting to try and make Winthrop into some proto-Republican, he just isn't. Winthrop believed in a system that was top-heavy. Power flowed down from God, through the government, and then eventually reached the individual. God was the sovereign and all power originated with him. An idea like the people being the sovereign would have been ludicrous to Winthrop. So when looking at Winthrop, it is important to always keep in mind what he was and what he wasn't. As much as we want to shoehorn Winthrop into an enlightened voice preaching democracy, Winthrop wasn't that and shouldn't be seen as such. Winthrop's policies are rooted in the Bible, not in the Enlightenment. For Winthrop, the chief argument against him over the years would continue to be his relative leniency. The argument which began with Thomas Dudley would continue as a running narrative through the later part of the 1630s. Despite the ongoing controversy, Winthrop would become governor again in the later half of the 1630s. 
Winthrop would ultimately serve four stints as the governor of Massachusetts for a total of 12 years. Winthrop's chief concern remained the risk of separatism. While Winthrop certainly believed in reforming the church, he would remain a staunch anti-separatist for the remainder of his life. This would often lead to tension between the more separatist-leaning members of the colony. This is going to be of particular importance when dealing with Roger Williams. Williams was, in comparison to Winthrop, nothing short of a radical in his ideology. A fierce separatist, Williams would end up bouncing from church to church as none of them reached the level of purity that he was seeking. We are going to go ahead and leave Roger Williams alone for now, however. He is going to get his time in the sun next episode. It is the interplay, however, of these two men that is really going to set the stage for some of the biggest controversies of the day, and we're going to see more of that next week. For Winthrop, he would spend much of the rest of his career attempting to parry the repeated attempts to change the religious direction of the colony. In two episodes' time, we are going to dig deeper into the increasingly complex religious situation in New England during the later half of the 1630s and moving into the 1640s. These attempts to steer the religious direction of the colony are always going to remain the most important thing for Winthrop. As you'll see, during that episode, Winthrop would spend the rest of his life right in the thick of the religious debate around New England. Well, practical governance was a pretty huge part of what he did. After all, the guy is the colonial governor in a harsh and unforgiving land. He always remained tightly tethered to his Puritan beliefs. Every decision he made was directed at maintaining the religious order that he helped establish upon arrival in Massachusetts. However, keep in mind that despite Winthrop using religion as the basis for basically everything, including how he runs the government, he is not in favor of a theocracy. In fact, Winthrop was distinctly aware of the dangers that come with a theocracy and actively sought to avoid it. And this makes sense. Think back to the origins of where the Puritans come from. They're Calvinists. They're coming out of the Reformation. The entire purpose of the Reformation is because the Catholic Church's hierarchy had become so corrupt in the eyes of people like Luther. So for Winthrop, he wants to avoid letting that kind of a hierarchical structure form where the government and the church are so closely intertwined. Winthrop recognized the danger of having the church and the government being the same entity. Winthrop wanted a government that would be protective of religion, a government guided by religion. However, the church needed to remain separate of government, and Winthrop knew it. The church had no official authority in the government, and the government was careful not to allow the church to affect civil rights. Winthrop spent much of the 1640s working through truant crises. The first question is if Winthrop was going to remain in Massachusetts to begin with. King Charles finally relented and called for Parliament. Suddenly, the Great Migration that had been going on for a decade not only ended, it threatened to reverse course. With Parliament meeting again, the doors were open to return to England. However, for Winthrop, he viewed his place as being in Massachusetts. Winthrop had built something in Massachusetts. He viewed his place in the world as remaining in the New World and working on supporting his more pure church. At the same time, however, a crippling depression hit the colony in the 1640s. This depression meant that Winthrop was personally forced to sell large amounts of his property to pay his personal debts. Now, without going into detail, the loss of his money was largely not Winthrop's fault personally. One of the men that he had put in charge of helping run his estates, James Luxford, was basically really awful at business and possibly corrupt. Luxford begun taking out large loans in Winthrop's name, loans that Winthrop would never be able to pay back. Ultimately, he cost Winthrop huge amounts of money and led Winthrop to selling off large amounts of his property to pay back the debts. Winthrop had spent his entire life battling to create a better society through a more pure church. By the summer of 1648, however, Winthrop's health had begun to decline. Despite this, however, he does appear to remain a leading member of the colony throughout the year. By February of 1649, Winthrop had developed a fever and a cough. While Winthrop would battle on for another month, on March 26, 1649, John Winthrop died. What is the legacy of John Winthrop? Winthrop clearly is amongst the most important colonial founders. He was off and on in charge of the Massachusetts Bay Colony nearly his entire time in America. However, being the governor alone is not really what makes Winthrop a standout. John Winthrop came to Massachusetts to create a society that he viewed as being more pure. 
absent was the corruption of England. Instead, what was left was a land where a more pure church could be created and flourish. By and large, he accomplished it. Sure, he was always fighting a battle with separatist factions, but Winthrop had created a church that he at least would have viewed as far better than anything that had existed prior to him leaving England. More than anything, however, the legacy of John Winthrop survives through his single line in the model of Christian charity. The idea of a city on a hill is something that has remained incredibly enduring throughout the history of the United States. In many ways, it is almost like a mission statement for what the United States strives to stand for. Though originally written for those settlers heading to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it has become something that even to this day stands as a guiding mission of the United States. John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, Barack Obama are just some of the future presidents that would quote that line from Winthrop. Even as I was sitting around writing this very episode, I saw an interview on TV where a member of the House giving an interview was talking about the United States' position as a shiny beacon on the hill, a common variant of this speech. Politically, Winthrop in his time ended up being something of a moderate within Massachusetts. That is not to say, however, that he was a moderate by any modern standards. Likewise, as tempting as it is to try and tout Winthrop as a product of the Enlightenment, he just really isn't. Sure, he talks about there being a covenant, which is a similar idea to the social contract. Winthrop, however, always viewed power as something that comes from the top and moves down. This wasn't a social contract whereby the people had the power and agreed to be governed. Instead, the power in this situation comes from God and everybody below had better fall in line. Winthrop shows this in his creation of the government in Massachusetts. Sure, he makes it more democratic. He allows for a limited popular vote. However, once voted into power, that person was nearly absolute in their power. Winthrop would lighten on this over time, much because necessity demanded it, but at no point would you consider Winthrop to be a particular proponent of democracy. Finally, I want to mention the impressive legacy that Winthrop has left behind in terms of descendants. The Winthrop family has remained a powerful political force throughout American history. Among the several important members of the family, you have Robert Winthrop, the Speaker of the House in the late 1840s. Robert Winthrop was the four times great-grandson of John Winthrop. And just in case you don't think the Winthrop family is still a force, former Senator from Massachusetts, Secretary of State and Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry is the eight-time great-grandchild of John Winthrop. So even after all of these years, the Winthrop family remains very much alive and politically influential. Well, John Winthrop may have fallen short on the ladder in terms of forming a more revolutionary society, Winthrop's words continue to serve as something that the United States strives to be. It is how the United States wants the world to view it. And for that, we have John Winthrop to thank. Next time, we are going to move on to the second biography episode of this show. If John Winthrop was a moderate, then Roger Williams must have seemed like a radical. In two weeks' time, we are going to dive in and start looking at the man who was so often at odds with John Winthrop and who would ultimately earn his place as one of the earliest founding fathers. Until then, I want to thank you for listening, and I will see you back here in two weeks as we look at the life of Roger Williams. <laughs>